Yeah, so so Contrail pipelines. This is really our uh, our GitOps mechanism and the GitOps approach that we're bringing into Contrail for your Kubernetes environment. Um, the the whole real idea behind this here um, is being able to turn around and take uh, automate some of the reliability for Contrail. Um, and this is based off an Argo CD you know workflow. So some of the nice parts here for those that are familiar with Argo, it's designed specifically for Kubernetes. Um, and it's already included in some other, uh, you know, distros such as OpenShift and so forth. Um, you know, it's facilitating GitOps um, method, single source of truth uh, towards that environment. So you're able to turn around and leverage a bunch of different test suites that we're going to have uh, with this as well. And then also do, uh, you know, kind of handling of config configuration drift in, in some of those things. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of jump right into it here. Quick overview here of just kind of some some ideas around validating the stack and how you can use control pipelines to do that. Um, so you know you you have a, a CI/CD test repository. Um, you're able to turn around and bring that into the the Argo workflow, uh, and then run some pre-checks if you'd like. Um, and you can do this based upon the control networking releases. So the idea here is to go ahead and be able to do uh, more uh, additional testing and qualification in a development environment and then um, being able to handle upgrades and so forth in a very holistic manner where it's not one component at a time, uh, but you can integrate multiple components together uh, for some of those functional tests um, as you go to, to upgrade your production environment. Um, so again, another component of kind of uh, extending a lot of work that's already been done within the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, in this case, it's, it's uh, specifically with um, Argo. And with that said, I think Roche is going to go ahead and uh, walk us through a demo. Um, uh, I'm Roche and I'm a DevOps engineer at uh, Juniper. So as Sean uh, has mentioned, uh, um, the Contrail pipeline uh, totally automates uh, um, <clears throat> most of these configs, uh, provisioning and uh, uh, updates, extra. And uh, this uh, really helps uh, in a larger system, especially when you have a uh, huge, uh, large number of uh, clusters and uh, the, num the number of uh, configs uh, when it goes uh, uh, more than uh, what uh, as a user can manage or an administrator can manage uh, themselves. So, um, so as a part of this demo, uh, I will be uh, uh, show, um, you know uh, creating uh, two. Um, uh, namespaces, uh, so which is pre provisioned um, and uh, these are isolated namespaces. And uh, I will be creating uh, uh, the uh, virtual network router in each of these uh, namespaces. Plus, I provisioned uh, a, a an app, uh, a WordPress app, uh, shop away, and uh, I also provisioned uh, in the DB tier. I provisioned um, the um, MySQL database application. So there's there's a web tier and there's a DB tier. These are the two namespaces. So um, the virtual uh, network router. In the uh, DB tier, I haven't uh, provisioned yet uh, because of which uh, the uh, shop away application is unable to access uh, uh, the uh, DB uh, uh, at uh, 3306 port. So I'll show you uh, how I provision that uh, to the gate and uh, that gets uh, immediately uh, uh, applied into the system. So let's jump into the demo. So this is the Git repo that I will be using for the demo. Uh, here, um, as part of the demo, I have uh, created uh, a base uh, uh, application, a network application, and the application itself. So the uh, the ba base folder basically contains all the configurations related to the namespace, and the network folder contains all the uh, uh, network uh, router configurations and the application has the configuration related to the database and the uh, shop away uh, application. So just to give an idea what's there in these. Uh, um, so if you could notice this is the virtual network router configuration that's present here. Um, so these are mapped as um, an application, uh, basically, uh, uh, that's a uh, Argo construct. Uh, so there are three uh, three different constructs that uh, uh, will be created here in Argo CD. So I have created a um, uh, the uh, system base, which basically uh, is uh, uh, configured to use the base directory in the uh, uh, in the Git repo. Similarly, I have the uh, network. Uh, uh, application which is configured to use the uh, network uh, and i have also uh, deployed the database and the uh, shopping application so as you could see this shopping application is currently uh, uh, is in progress and it is basically uh, uh, not um, able to reach out to the port so it is in crash loop back uh, so i will show that uh, as part of the uh, uh, the cube conf cube uh, console um, so yeah going back here 
to the network configuration. So as you could see here, I have these uh, uh, two configurations pulled up from the uh, network here. So there's a network policy and then there's this VNR. So this is got pulled in and that is what you are seeing here. And this is uh, another config that is uh, 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 pre-created by the uh, network uh, router once uh, it is deployed. So let me go ahead and uh, create, um, and uh, I, have, I have a sample folder here where I have placed uh, uh, some sample configs, which is basically has the VNR configs uh, what I want. So let me just show you what's there as a part of the VNR config. So here, if you could see there's a virtual uh, network router and uh, uh, it's a web tire that is uh, being created and it's being attached to the uh, DB tire. So let me copy it into the network folder here. Uh, uh, four to five minutes for the uh, ergo to get uh, itself refreshed, but on in the interest of time, I will go ahead and refresh it manually. So, if you could see the new configuration got pulled in, and I'll go for the sync. So, this gets synced into the system. Yeah, you see all the configs in here that's got created. So now let's go to the application. So I have the uh, shopping application here. Let's see whether the application is reachable now. So let me go ahead and sh uh, check out the logs. Okay. So as you would have noticed, uh, the application initially was uh, unable to reach uh, the uh, the database server so once uh, we move the we push the config it is uh, able to reach out the server now uh, and it should come up in a minute yes it's come up there we go ah yeah the application is live um, so this basically eases the whole uh, operation. So, um, so we, 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 we are giving this as a part of uh, uh, the test suite uh, for, uh, as a part of the contrail itself. So um, now let, let me showcase you how the drift uh, happens and, uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and manually change the uh, system configuration manually. And uh, uh, the Ergo uh, identifies this uh, automatically and it is uh, able to notify you about the change that happened uh, out of bound. And uh, once uh, that is found, uh, uh, we, we, can, we have a choice to make that uh, uh, sync manual or uh, automated. So currently I've made that manual because uh, uh, it, it is uh, too fast that it just reapplies the config. So I want to show you how it uh, showcases. It, it, it shows it makes the diff between the old and the new configuration that got changed. Uh, so as you could see here uh, in the config, so so this is the configuration that we have here now. Let me go ahead and change the network policy, which is uh, here where uh, we have the following network conf, uh, policy here uh, with uh, uh, 3303 and uh, 80 port. So this is the live config that you see here. So as a part of this, this, this is the live config in the system. So let me go ahead and change uh, the config. So this is the NPDB tire config that I'm gonna change, uh, which is an out of bound change. Uh, so let me try to remove these two ports. So as you could notice there, it, it is uh, Ergo is showing that particular uh, policy as out of sync. So you, if you could go in and look at the diff, you would uh, specifically be able to see the difference between the uh, uh, the the one uh, that is present and then one one uh, was there earlier. And so if we so if you make this automated sync policy as automated, which currently I've disabled here. So if you make this automated, this this would have synced by now. So let me go ahead and try to, uh, to sync it manually. Yep, uh, it's got synced and uh, 
So as you could see, it just got, uh, so this, this basically, you know, identifies the configuration diff and it is able to uh, reprovision it. Um, so, so as, as a summary, uh, you know, uh, it, it totally avoids uh, the whole uh, Git pipeline totally avoids uh, the repeatability uh, part of it. And uh, it helps you in uh, auditing the whole uh, config that is being uh, managed across all different systems. Uh, and uh, uh, since we are using Git, it also helps in uh, reviewing the kind of changes that uh, is being provisioned uh, into the system. Uh, similarly, uh, Git being a single source of truth, it can be, uh, 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 it, that's the only place where uh, the, use, uh, the administrators will be provisioning their configs. So they, they really don't need to go into the uh, different Kubernetes uh, clusters that they have and manage it, uh, which becomes more cumbersome with more, more than number of our the larger the system is um, and it also helps uh, you in uh, you know having uh, RBAC policies uh, uh, to manage your configuration so that only specific users are given specific uh, 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 your right access to uh, some of the configs so uh, overall uh, um, uh, the, the the git pipeline eases uh, the whole operations uh, part of uh, uh, your kubernetes config uh, and c into config management that's really awesome, Roche. Um, thank you so much for the phenomenal demo. Um, first yeah. of all, I want to thank you all for the great questions today. Uh, we covered a broad range of topics. Hopefully, we showed you how Contrail extends the default networking behavior of Kubernetes, uh, offering um, just a, a very flexible, powerful way to deliver default pod networking, but at the same time, augmenting the default networking behaviors with a, a really rich set of tools that you can use to build custom topologies, manage security, uh, and then you can further extend what we've created uh, using uh, pipelines and GitOps to add reliability and scale to your cluster management. Uh, something sneaky, we actually showed you, I think, three or four different interfaces today, um, and that really goes a long way to show the power of our Kubernetes API integration. Essentially, whether you're using kubectl, canines, lens, or Argo CD, you can control and configure Contrail in a Kubernetes cluster, so you can pick the right tool to, to do the job. Um, uh, this is Frank Wells. I've got a quick question uh, on, on your CNI in general. I, I assume you guys don't do any like network, like low level encryption between these networks, right? Like it's just a straight old normal IP network, right? Like there's no, in, you know, encryption between clusters, for example. Yeah, there's there's no encryption in the overlay. The overlay tunnels that we use are um, either MPLS over UDP based, so just normal UDP traffic or VXLAN based, depending on what network devices we're trying to talk to. And then we leverage cool. encryption from other layers of the stack. I, I figured. Um, one, my other question is: Have you have you done any performance comparison with other CNIs? I, I you guys are doing a lot more, and I was just curious. You know, if, if what if any performance hit would you see switching to Contrail? Um, so, like Prasad was mentioning, we have a couple different flavors of the data plane, and each flavor is really fit for a different performance profile. So, the kernel modules are capable of multiple tens of gigs of traffic, um, and depending on the amount of hardware they have, like newer CPUs will get better throughput. Um, one, once we need to get up above the multi 10 gig mark, um, closer to 100 gig of throughput, we leverage DPDK or SmartNex. Um, DPDK carves off CPUs from the system itself to give you more shared forwarding performance and fixed latency. And um, the uh, SmartNex move the entire data plane to an accelerator on the network interface itself. A lot of this seemed to be seemed to me like it would be something I'd run in my own data center. Um, do you have people currently using this solution in AWS and Azure? Are they doing it on managed services like AKS, or are they doing it on uh, their own self-provisioned Kubernetes clusters? Uh, there's a mix. We have customers who are using self-provisioned clusters in the cloud. We also have a subset of those using managed Kubernetes instances. Um, there's Pretty much the, uh, everything we've shown you today can be used um, in a public cloud, um, but the, the interfaces or the way that we expose services changes a little. So for example, we'll use a network load balancer to front end um, uh, services when we're deploying in a public cloud versus advertising routes out to a gateway. Um, that'll change, like um, the front end service will change from say a load balancer to just node port as we plug into the, the NLBs in the public cloud. 
Um, but yeah, the, the overlay traffic forward, uh, pardon me, overlay traffic forwarding, network policy enforcement, virtual networks, all of that is abstracted away from the public cloud. So regardless of whether you're using a managed instance or a self-provisioned instance of Kubernetes, you can still consume all of these features. Okay. I think that, that could enable some topologies that are not normally available um, on the public clouds just because of the limitations of how they present the network to you. Um, adding amazing. your own virtual network on top of it gives you some new options. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's why we do this, right? It gives you the uh, ability to do horrible things like stretch subnets and wonderful things like overlap IPs. <laughs> So one more question, where do you think this is moving, like in two, three years, where do you want to have that product? What is, what's the future for it? I think in um, a couple of years time, we're going to see uh, more of a shift from OpenStack and some of the classic VM orchestrators over to Kubernetes. So we'll see less concern about bridging orchestrators and more concern about connecting clouds as we have Kubernetes clusters scattered across public and private clouds. Um, I think we'll, multi-cluster is going to become even more of uh, a focus over the next couple of years. Multi-clustering Kubernetes has just really started to be solved uh, as a problem. So I will see more maturity in that space as well. Um, I'm still holding out uh, hope that smart NICs are going to become ubiquitous within the next couple of years. So we'll see where we need it, just ludicrous data plane performance out of the smart NICs. Um, but also I'm, I'm really hoping on the total opposite side that we gain more portability from operating systems and infrastructure through enhancements like eBPF and the data plane. And uh, other areas uh, are like you know, between the OpenStack to Kubernetes, we can uh, have the bridge using uh, uh, contrail networking. 